Good morning, church. Please rise and join me in the call to worship. Jesus said, do not worry about your life. Strive first for the reign of God, Jesus said, and God's righteousness. And all these other things that you worry about will be given to you as well, Jesus promised. We come on the first day of the week to worship God. Please remain standing and join me in the prayers of forgiveness. Do we bring our fresh fruits or do we bring our leftovers? Do we bring our best to sharing your love with others whom we might or do we reserve our best to serve other causes facing so many demands for our time talent and treasures. Help us to reflect on what we mean to strive first for your reign. Hear the good news. Who is in the position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. Friends, believe the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. <laughs>
please be seated. Good morning. I welcome any children who are here on this four-day holiday weekend to come and join me for a time for the children. If not, I can do a monologue. I will speak to all the children who are out there. So, wonderful. So one of the things that we're talking about in church for these few weeks is stewardship. That's a really big word. And so, and so one of the things that means is how do we take care of things that we don't own? How do we take care of that? So when you go to school or when you go to preschool or someplace and you get a library book or you get a book from your teacher, do you take care of it? Do you? Yeah, I take care of my diary. That's right. Do you tear out the pages or color on the pages? No. Oh, no. We take care of these things. We're very good to these things. How about if your teacher gives you pencils? Do you break them? You take good care of them. That's wonderful. Do you know we also live in the earth? We don't own the earth, but we take care of it, right? What do we do sometimes when we're finished with things? You know this word? We recycle them, right? We recycle our stuff, or sometimes we put in energy-efficient bolts. And we turn, do you turn off the lights? Okay, that we can turn off the lights when we leave rooms? Ah. What happens at church? Have you ever seen, have you ever been here on Earth Day when we go out and we help to prune? We clean up the bushes and things around here? I see some of my fellow volunteers on Earth Day. We come out and we clean up the church. And sometimes when people um, give donations and pledges, you know what helps us buy? What are these things? Glue sticks for Sunday school. It's so exciting. We get new glue sticks for Sunday school and when they're dry, right? Sometimes when they're dry, we have to go get new ones. And so that's some of the stuff that, uh, that we do it for church, right? We give donations and pledges for church. That's wonderful. So that's how we take care of things that we don't own. So can we wave to all these nice people out here and thank them for buying us glue sticks for Sunday school? Yes, thank you all very much for buying us those glue sticks. And now, do you remember how we say the piece? Kind of? Okay, let's stand up. Can we stand up? All right, I'll come down here with you. Let's stand up. Hold hands. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Peace be with you.
seated. We welcome you to the service of worship. Glad that you're here spending a part of your Sunday with us. We invite you to pass those uh, maroon folders through the pews and sign your names on them. We also welcome those who are joining us by television broadcast on hometown television and uh, those who will join us uh, this week on our YouTube channel uh, broadcast. I uh, hope that everyone feels a part of our worshiping community. I want to extend a special welcome to two elders who are assisting in worship, Claire Davis, who is our worship leader today, and Emily Campbell, who did our children's sermon. Uh, thank you for being here and doing that. Absolutely. Our associate pastor, Deborah Huggins, is on vacation this weekend, along with the uh, half the state of New Jersey, uh, and uh, we'll be back in the office on Tuesday. Also on vacation this weekend is uh, Dr. Charity Wicks, uh, and so uh, we want to thank Adam Gilbert and the Adult Praise Band and others for filling in all charities away. Thank you guys very much. Absolutely. I want to highlight the Senior Lunch Bunch uh, is happening today right after this worship service. You're invited to come over to the North Classroom. Uh, that's for adult seniors uh, to come over to the um, North Classroom and share lunch and some time together. Even if you didn't sign up for that, please go ahead and go on over. There's plenty of food and you'd be welcome to be a part of that uh, today. Um, we're continuing our Thanksgiving food drive um, for another week and you can pick up uh, the bags with a shopping list on them at the door uh, and uh, go shopping this week for some grocery items that then we'll, we'll donate to neighbors who could use them. So I um, uh, hope that you'll help us be a part of our Thanksgiving food drive. There are a bunch of other announcements about upcoming events and I hope that you will uh, look at those uh, on the insert and pay attention to those and participate as, um, as makes sense for you to participate. A couple of prayer requests I want to pass along to you. First of all, uh, we're being asked to pray for Martha Anderson, who is scheduled for surgery later this week. Um, and Martha's asking for your prayers as she uh, has that procedure done. We've also been asked by Dee Robertson for your, your prayers, um, for our prayers. Uh, Dee is in Texas where she's recovering from back surgery. Uh, she reports that that recovery is a little more involved than she thought it would be, so she's asking for your prayers as she goes uh, through that recovery time. I don't know if there's anybody here to speak for stewardship. They must be on vacation too. Uh, but uh, let me just uh, highlight as you come, come in through this doorway out here, uh, there's that church and then there's those people and what we're trying to do is move uh, folks into the church at once a pledge form has been returned to the office. Next Sunday, we'll have a special time to dedicate uh, pledge forms. But really what the stewardship uh, team is after the, this week is, a re, is some sort of response. Uh, what they're really counting are the number of folks, number of members who make a pledge. That's it. Just the number of folks who make a pledge. So even if you think, well, I, don't, I, I can't pledge that much, if you can make one, uh, that's what we're uh, particularly interested in in the stewardship ep effort this year. So uh, please do fill out a f pledge form. There's a s uh, stamped envelope that you got with your uh, mailing earlier uh, in October. Um, use that uh, or bring it by the church or bring it next Sunday and uh, be a part. Move into the, into the building, into that church out in the glass hallway. Our scripture lesson today is taken from the Gospel of Mark. I'm continuing this uh, look at uh, stewardship uh, that started last uh, Sunday and um, hoping that you're finding that you'll find that our pledge break isn't too painful um, as if we were watching PBS waiting for them to get back to the show we really tuned in to watch. Uh, but anyway, um, we're going to continue with this and we're in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, in the 12th chapter, to set this in a little bit of broad context, 
in the, in the story of Jesus' life. This happens after Palm Sunday. Jesus is in Jerusalem. And the context for this story is the temple in Jerusalem. That's where Jesus is uh, as this action unfolds. Uh, and, and it's the last week of Jesus' life. Listen and hear God's word as it comes to us in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, beginning to read at verse 41. Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. May God bless her understanding this reading of God's holy word and to God's name be glory and praise. Amen. There is a growing consensus among biblical scholars that Jesus was not so much commending the widow in this passage as he was critiquing a system that took everything she had to live on while accepting uncritically the large sums of money that rich people gave from their abundance. Or as you would more properly translate that Greek phrase, the rich people contributed out of what they had left over after they had spent all that they wanted to spend on all they wanted to have. And scholars have been drawn to this interpretation by what Jesus said about the temple system of his day in the passage just before the one that I just read to you. As I said to you, Jesus is in the temple in Jerusalem, and he's been there for a while, and he's made varieties of comments critiquing that system. And just before the passage that I read to you, Jesus said to to the crowd, they devour widows' houses, and the they in that sentence is the temple leadership, the temple system. They devour widows' houses in order to support this system. And then when Jesus sat down to watch people put money into the treasury, assessed money into the treasury, he saw that reality in full display. As he watched the crowd putting their money in, he watched a widow put in everything she had to live on. And to Jesus, these scholars would tell us that was unfair. He saw that as unjust. The inequality of it was breathtaking. Oh Lord, is there nothing more anybody can do? Oh, Lord, there must be something you can say. Oh, think twice. It's just another day for you. You and me in paradise.
to think twice. The poor widow crying out to the man on the street. Can you help me? As she puts in all that she had to live on. As I said last Sunday, I plan to focus these three Sundays on three verses in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17, 18, and 19. I even suggested this homework. You could read those three verses. The quiz will be later in the service. And those three verses are dealing with practical advice that Paul gave to folks about how to be rich while still living faithfully. And as I said last Sunday, by the world's standards, most of us are rich. Although, to be honest, I don't know if I convinced anybody. Because, the truth is, most of us don't feel rich. And that's because we don't really know how to be rich. The Bible has a lot to teach us about how to be rich while living faithfully. But we really don't know how to do that. And as I said last Sunday, the first step according to what Paul had to say in 1 Timothy 6 verse 17 was that those of us who have been blessed with a lot of this world's riches, we need to fight a strong battle against the migration of hope. That is, those of us who have a lot of this world's good, we have this tendency to have our hope migrate. Putting our trust in our riches rather than in the one who richly provides. In God we trust. That's the very first thing we must remember if we want to be rich and live faithfully. Our trust has to center in God, not in our stuff. But how do we do that? Well, it seems to me that Paul gives us some pretty practical advice. After pointing out the danger, this migration of hope danger that rich people face, Paul gives some practical advice about how to avoid that in verse 18. In that verse, Paul advises rich people to do good, to be rich in good works, generous, ready to share. Rich people are to be known, in other words, not for how much money they have and not in how many things they own, but rich people are to be known for their generosity, sharing what they have with others who are in need and sharing it freely. Rich people are to be above average in the good they do in the world because Rich people have been given an opportunity to do so much good in the world since, for the one thing, most of us, you know, we don't have to work constantly just in order to survive. And so we have an opportunity to do a lot of good in the world. But is that how it really works in the real world. Are rich people more generous? Well, there was a study done several years ago that showed in the United States, on the average, those earning $50,000 or less a year gave away about 6% of their income to charity, while those earning $200,000 or more, on average in the United States, gave away about 4% of their income. Those 
earning more than two hundred thousand dollars, sometimes sometimes gave what appeared to be large sums, just like the rich people in that story in the Gospel of Mark. But like them, they gave for the most part out of their abundance. That is, out of what they had left over after they had paid for everything else that they wanted slash thought they needed. Andy Stanley, the man I've been referring to a lot, in his book says this happens because a lot of people in the United States are three S givers. That is, lots of people in the United States give spontaneously, that's the first S, we give spontaneously, usually in response to an emotional appeal for our money. We give sporadically because we've grown adept at insulating ourselves from those emotional appeals. And we give sparingly with Americans giving less for a variety of reasons than they used to give. Pastor Stanley challenges us to become 3P givers. Prioritizing, first P, prioritizing our giving. Not waiting until the end of the tax year when we go to figure it all out and see what we actually gave at the end of the year but prioritizing, pre-deciding how much we're going to live on, including how much we need to put into savings, and also pre-deciding how much we're going to give away. And he challenges us to think about that priority in terms of percentage, second P, the percentage of our income. What percent of your income are you going to pre-decide to give away in 2020? It's that practical. What percent will you pre-decide, prioritize to give away in 2020? And third, Pastor Stanley says to be fair, to be just, to move towards equality, that percentage given away should be progressive. That is, the more we have, the bigger the percentage should be that we give away. Since there should be limits on what we spend on ourselves. Just because we have it doesn't mean it's quite all right to spend it on ourselves. If we engage in this kind of faith-filled financial planning, if we plan not to consume everything that we earn, then that is the second step we need to take if we're going to feel rich. And that is the step we need to take to prevent our hope from migrating from the one who richly provides to our riches. The step we need to take to affirm in God we trust. Because if we engage in this kind of financial planning, then we will find that it's not just for the Bill Gates of this world to sit around and think about what causes they want to support. No, any of us, all of us, can do that. Of course, I don't know your personal situation, but if you wanted to go along on this path, a good place to start would be to calculate what percentage of your income you gave away last year. Not this year, because there's still some time left, but what did you give away as a percent of your income in 2018? What was it? And if, especially it was less than 6%, then pre-decide this coming year 
to increase the percent of your income that you plan to give away and plan to give it away now for 2020, not in December of 2020. Plan to increase the percentage of your income that you're going to give away. You can give that money to the church, you can give it to other causes that mean a lot to you. And my suggestion to be would be that you need to give to that point where you actually, you and your family, have to go without something. Because as Christians, we know what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us that one of the most dangerous temptations we face is self-indulgence. This is not what we hear in our consumer culture. We think that self-indulgence is an affirmation of our selfhood, but it isn't, the Bible says. It's dangerous. And if we want to prevent the harm that comes from indulging ourselves, then what we need to do is make sacrifices. We need to sacrifice things. And there is spiritual benefit in that. The Bible teaches that over and over and over again. As does experience. Dr. Tony Campolo tells a story of taking his son and daughter when they were teenagers to visit the schools that their family had chosen to support in Haiti. And they had supported those schools for years. Their family had done without some things in order to support those schools because as a Baptist pastor, then as a struggling graduate student in sociology, there's no money in sociology, let's be honest. So their income had been really low. And yet, they had made this priority to give money to support schools in Haiti going without some things so that they could do that. Well, when they arrived at those schools for their visit, they were greeted like celebrities. There was a whole crowd of people from the village that had gathered to welcome them there. And when they arrived and stepped off the, out of the car, the folks hugged them and they sang for them and they danced with them. It was like the arrival of, I don't know, Beyonce. And as they sat on the plane going home, Tony reports that his teenage son, his teenage son who barely said two words to him, his teenage son said to him, Dad, I want you to know that there's nothing you could have done with that money. There's nothing on the face of this earth you could have bought for me that would have made me any happier than I am right now. This is our opportunity to know that kind of joy. We have that chance. We have that choice. You and me. We have this incredible opportunity to do good in a world that's desperate for people who are trying to do good for the world not just for themselves. To be rich in good works, far exceeding the average. To be generous and known as people who are more generous than any other people on the face of the globe. To share. To share what we have freely, hands open, not clenched shut. This is our chance. 
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that in Jesus Christ we meet a God who is generous, who shares freely, whose hands are always open to us, whose arms are always open to us to bless, not to curse, to love, not to push away. And gracious God, we ask that as we come at the beginning of this new week to worship and praise you, that we would become more like you. So that we can shine the light of your love and your generosity into a world desperate for it. Desperate. And this weekend, as we as a nation pause to remember those who served in military service over the years and who serve now. And as we give thanks for the gift they gave, this incredible gift they gave and give each day to us Gracious God, we ask that in our own ways we would find ways to give. To take a stand for what's just and what's good and what's fair so that your children can be free. Holy God, We pray that you would be with all of those who struggle and who are put down and kept down. And we pray that you would use us, that you would open our eyes to see the reality that surrounds us, that you would open our hearts to feel for the people with whom we have daily contact and to open our hands and to be known above all else as those who are generous, who share what they can, who offer whatever help they can to lift others up. Holy God, hear us, we pray. For we pray this in Jesus' name, as together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. This is an offering. We're not paying for anything here. There's nothing that we need to buy. What we're doing is offering what we've been given. Offering it back and putting our trust in the one who richly provides.
Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, from you comes every good and perfect gift. We give you praise and thanks for all your mercies. Your goodness has created us. Your bounty has sustained us. Your discipline has chastened us. Your patience has borne with us. Your love has redeemed us. Give us a heart of love to love and serve you. Enable us to show our thankfulness for all your goodness and mercy by giving up ourselves to your service and cheerfully submitting in all things to your blessed will. Through Jesus Christ our Savior, amen. This service of worship has ended, and we go from this place to serve God in all that we say, in all that we do, in all who we are. None of us knows what will happen this week. For some, there will be great joy and triumph, and for others, there'll be sadness, and there'll be defeat. But whatever it is that we face this week, we do not face it alone. But we face it all in the strength and the power of the Almighty God, who is always near and who does put this love in our hearts. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and stay with you now and forever. Amen. Amen.